Chapter 1, Section 5 The Holy Communion Controversy Between Luther and Zwingli Of the latter antagonisms which stirred men's minds, Protestantism and the Reformation movement should really receive our first consideration. Only this phenomenon is of such complexity that it must first be resolved into many separate psychological processes before it can become an object for analytical elucidation. But that lies outside my province. I must therefore content myself by selecting a single case from that great arena, namely the Holy Communion controversy between Luther and Zwingli. The transubstantiation dogma, already mentioned, was sanctioned by the Lateran Council of 1215, and from that time formed an established article of faith, in which form Luther himself grew up. Although the notion that a ceremony and its concrete practice can have an objective redeeming value is really quite unevangelical, since the evangelical movement was actually directed against Catholic institutions, Luther was nevertheless unable to free himself from the immediately effective sensuous impression in the taking of bread and wine. He perceived in it not merely a token, but the actual sensuous reality with its contingent and immediate experience. These were for him an indispensable religious necessity. He therefore claimed the actual presence of the body and blood of Christ in the communion. In and beneath bread and wine, he received the body and the blood of Christ. For him, the religious meaning of the immediate objective experience was so great that his imagination was spellbound by the concretism of the material presence of the sacred body. All his attempts at explanation are, therefore, under the spell of this fact. The body of Christ is present, albeit non-spatially. According to the so-called doctrine of consubstantiation, the actual substance of the sacred body was also really present beside the substance of the bread and wine. The ubiquity of Christ's body, which this assumption postulated, an idea involving considerable distress to human intelligence, was indeed substituted by the concept of voli presence, which means that God is everywhere present where he wills to be. But Luther, untroubled by all these difficulties, held unflinchingly to the immediate experience of the sensuous impression, and preferred to assuage all the scruples of human reason with explanations which were either absurd or, at best, quite unsatisfying. It is hardly credible that it was merely the power of tradition which determined Luther to cling to this dogma, for he assuredly gave abundant proof of his ability to throw aside traditional forms of belief. Indeed, we should not go far wrong in assuming that it was rather the actual contact with the real and material in the communion, and the feeling significance of this contact for Luther himself, that prevailed over the evangelical principle, which maintained that the word was the sole vehicle of grace, and not the ceremony. With Luther the word certainly had redeeming power, but the partaking of the communion was also a transmitter of grace. This, I repeat, must have been only an apparent concession to the institutions of the Catholic Church, for in reality it was the acknowledgment, demanded by Luther's psychology, of the fact of feeling, grounded upon the immediate sense experience. As against the Lutheran standpoint, Zwingli represented the purely symbolic conception. What really concerned him was a spiritual partaking of the body and blood of Christ. This standpoint has the character of reason. It is a conceptual attitude to the ceremony. It has the merit that it offers no violence to the evangelical principle, and at the same time it avoids all hypotheses that run counter to reason. This conception, however, does little justice to the thing which Luther wished to preserve, namely, the reality of the sense impression and its peculiar feeling value. Zwingli, it is true, also administered the communion, and with Luther also partook of bread and wine. Nevertheless, his conception contained no formula which could have adequately rendered the unique sensational and feeling value of the object. Luther gave a formula for this, but it was opposed to reason and the evangelical principle. To the standpoint of sensation and feeling, this matters little, and indeed rightly, for the idea, the principle, is just as little concerned about the sensation of the object. Both points of view are, in the last resort, mutually exclusive. The Lutheran formation favors the extroverted conception of things, while Zwingli has the conceptual standpoint. Although Zwingli's formula does no violence to feeling and sensation, but merely gives a conceptual formulation, and appears furthermore to have left room for the efficacy of the object, Yet it seems as though the extroverted standpoint is not content with an open space, but demands also a formulation in which the conceptual follows the sensuous value, exactly as the conceptual formulation requires the subservience of feeling and sensation. 
At this point, with the consciousness of having given merely a statement of the problem, I close this chapter on the principle of types in the history of classic and medieval thought. I am not sufficiently competent to be able to treat so difficult and voluminous a problem in any way exhaustively. If I have been successful in conveying to the reader an impression of the existence of typical differences of standpoint, my purpose has been achieved. I need scarcely add that I am aware that none of the material here touched upon has been conclusively dealt with. I must bequeath this task to those who command a fuller knowledge of this province than myself. End of section 9. Recording by Olivia.